This is our pre-recorded lecture for Theme 3 Part A, Psychological Assessment in Adults. In this episode we ask, what is intelligence? Why is an operational definition something that might save a bridge but might not save psychology? And what do common folk think and does it really matter? And then we are going to start looking at the early major theories of intelligence. Francis Galton's theory, silly old racist or something more? And Charles Spearman's theory, will he hit your G-spot? That and more on PSYC 13020, all coming up. Hello again. Well, one thing I forgot to mention in the intro, um, I'll tell you about the learning outcomes. So in this theme, you're going to be presented with material that will help you meet learning outcomes one and six. So these are two learning outcomes you get for the price of one. Hey, not bad, eh? So let's start off by defining intelligence. What is intelligence? Well, it turns out there's not a simple answer. and this is actually quite usual in psychology, you might have noticed by now. What we have are multiple definitions uh, and multiple theories about intelligence. And broadly, they range from those that see intelligence as an inheritable state and those that see it as environmentally determined. And you get some theories that will see it as a mix of the two. And again, this is a common thing in psychology. Again, you might have already noticed this. Now in these videos for theme three, I'll briefly summarize some of the key theories of intelligence. Now remember, you will need to read our prescribed text to get a full understanding of each theory. This video, video will not give you everything you need for that online quiz. It will give you the spark to fuel a discussion in our class meeting, but it's not intended to be doing anything else other than that, okay? so. Let's start with a seemingly simple and unambiguous definition of intelligence. This is the operational definition. And an operational definition is where a concept is defined by the way it's operationalized. And commonly this means it is defined by the way it is measured. So you might define weight by saying that it is the thing that a weighing scale measures. Or perhaps less circular looking, Weight is the number shown on the readout of a weighting scale. Weighting scale? <laughs> Weighing scale. <laughs> you know what I mean. Now that still sounds a bit circular, you know. What is weight? Answer, it's the thing that is measured by a weighing scale. And what's a weighing scale? It's the thing that measures weight. Now, that sounds really like a circular argument, eh? doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of theory, like the theory of gravity or Einstein's theory of general relativity, 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 <laughs> insert real word, <laughs> relativity. There you go, Einstein's theory of relativity. But operational definitions can be incredibly useful. If you're in construction, for example, and you're told that a supporting beam can support a weight of two tons, the operational definition of weight is useful. How do you know it weighs two tons? Well, because that was the readout on the weighing scale. Now, say there was a requirement, oh, it, by the way, in that, <laughs> that instance, you know, if you say, I need a, a beam that weighs two tons, you don't kind of look around and try to understand Einstein's theory of relativity. You can say it now. <laughs> You don't do that, you just you just want to know how you need to find out the weight, weighing scale. Okay. Now, say there was a requirement for the sporting beam to be flat. If you don't have an operational definition of flat, you have no way of knowing what flat is. And thus, when something is either flat or, or um, flat enough, 
you know, how, how do you know if it's flat or flat enough? You have no definition that specifies how flatness is measured, and that's why operational definition is, is important. Now, on October the 15th, 1970, the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne, Australia, collapsed, and 35 construction workers were killed. There was an inquiry, and it found that the collapse occurred because engineers had specified the supply of a quantity of flat steel plate, but the word flat in that context had lacked an operational definition. So there was no test for accepting or rejecting a particular shipment of steel as either flat, not flat, or not flat enough, or for controlling the quality in that regard. So some of the plate turned out not to be flat enough and it caused the bridge to buckle and the bridge collapsed. Now the problem with the operational definition of intelligence is that there is no agreement on the theory of intelligence. Operational definitions do look a bit odd, but they're perfectly acceptable in many areas, particularly the physical sciences, where having a clear and unambiguous definition can be really very uh, useful. Um, so, unlike weight, where you can use an operational definition, weight is that which is measured by a weighing scale. Having an operational definition of intelligence is problematic because the concept used in psychology, most of the concepts we use in psychology are actually just inferred states rather than uh, something that's directly observable, like a directly observable state. And in psychology we don't have that same level of agreement um, about the concepts that we use. Uh, people disagree about what intelligence is and how it should be measured. And unlike weight, so you may disagree, disagree with your weighing scale. My weighing scale this morning clearly told me a lie. It told me I'd put on three kilos. Uh, that's not true. I'm going to buy a new weighing scale. It must be faulty. Um, so operational definitions um, are good, but operational definitions also limit the consideration of new ways of measuring something. So in a case of intelligence, when you've got operational definition of intelligence, one, it's not great because people argue over what intelligence is and how you should measure it, but having an operational definition actually limits the opportunity for you to look at those other ways of measuring it. Um, because it's already been defined by the way it's measured. You know, we're saying that intelligence is the thing that's measured by an IQ test, so it limits what you, how you measure intelligence, because the assumption is you'll always use an IQ test. Okay. Now you can hold something and physically feel its weight, but you can't feel intelligence in the same way. It's something that's more intuitive and conceptual. It may be premature to have an operational definition of something when there's no agreement on what that something is. So we find in psychology, we still have competing definitions of what intelligence is and competing theories and no agreed way of measuring it. That's why the textbook is so long. You know, you prescribe text, the chapters on intelligence, it's, you, you make your way through those chapters, you'll, you, you'll see that there's a lot of tests to cover because the, there's a lot of tests and all the tests are very different. Now, again, this is quite common in psychology. And this is where psychology is quite unlike a science like physics. What all of this means is that the operational definition of intelligence should have big warning signs around it, you know, ex use with extreme caution. So, definitions of intelligence that come from experts in the field are wide and varied. Also, many theories of intelligence have proven to be highly problematic in terms of their objectivity. They have been found to be biased towards Western cultures. Definitions have largely come from Anglo-American countries and reflect the cultural assumptions of the West. So in the US, the focus has been very much on the individual. This is known, in, known as individualism, where is, whereas in countries in Asia, there is much more of a focus on the family and the group and the community. This is known as collectivism. So in those latter countries, we find importance placed on things such as humility, ethics, social relationships, and so on. And these things have tended to be absent in intelligence tests. 
though um, that's slowly changing. Now, one really useful way of thinking about the difference between, this is a little bit of a distraction perhaps, but an interesting way of thinking about the distinction between an individualistic culture and a collectivist culture is thinking about the way people insult people. In an individualistic culture, you are going to direct your insults at the individual because that's where it's going to hurt most. So you're going to call someone an idiot. Yeah? In a collectivist culture, you're going to direct your insults at someone's family. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Or their group or their community or maybe even their country. So here, rather than say, oi, you're an idiot, you'll say, oi, your mother's an idiot. And that's going to hurt more. That's going to be really hurtful because those things in the collectivist culture matter more. Anyway, there's a bit of a distraction there. So, um, one way of getting to the heart of what intelligence is, is to actually look at what non-academics say. What do they say it is? What does the lay person say that, uh, uh, intelligence is? And this is useful because if you have a definition that resembles that which people use in everyday life, then it's more likely that your theory and your work on that concept will capture the public's imagination. And psychology, again, has a history of doing this. Emotion is an example of this. Psychology grabbed hold of the concept of emotions as a means to popularize the profession. It delivered back to the public a theory of emotion that resembled how people talked about emotion. And that way, psychology gained some cultural currency. And this strategy is one of the reasons why psychology has become so successful and has attracted perhaps so many students. So, expert opinion usually defines intelligence as involving verbal intelligence and some problem-solving ability, and ability to apply intelligence in practical settings. The lay definition adds to this social competence. And the problem is that practical intelligence is hard to measure, as is social competence. That really messes things up. <laughs> That's why we struggle with this concept of intelligence, mainly because of those two factors that are so hard to measure. Now, another way of simplifying the definitions that abound in academia and with lay people's understanding is that it involves some sort of learning from experience and adaptation to one's environment. Now, a question for our discussion class might be, how well do you think intelligence tests do this? How well did they measure our adaptation to the environment, for example? Now, once you've read the relevant chapter, come to class and we can talk about that, perhaps. Stick that on the agenda if you want that discussed in our class meeting. Now, let's get into some of the different definitions. We'll put them on a timeline, starting with the oldest first and then eventually getting to the most recent. But what I'm presenting is not a clear linear sequence where each person's work builds on that of another person's. Rather, we see different the theories competing and supplanting each other. It's kind of like a battleground, you know? It's not this nice linear progression of building knowledge, building knowledge, each person, person theorist building on the work that's previously been done. No, it's all like warfare, usually, in psychology. So what we find is that theories come along and new tests come along, and okay, they borrow bits that have done, been done before, but usually they come up with something completely new. But what we also find is that each element of these tests and these the theories kind of lingers. Each of the theories that I'll describe kind of still percolates around in uh, culture and in practice, in um, education and employment practices. Elements of all of these theories still, still sit there, they still exist. They haven't been completely obliterated. They survive today. So let's look way, way back at Francis Galton. Francis Galton is also known as the father of eugenics. This is the project that sought to enhance humanity through a specified breeding program. Yeah, yuck. <laughs> Francis Galton 
and Charles Darwin are actually half cousins, and Galton was very influenced by Darwin's theory of evolution. Thus, Galton linked intelligence to genetics. You were either born stupid or born intelligent. It was genetically predetermined. Now, for, it might sound like a bit of an outrageous idea to you, I don't know, <clears throat> but it certainly wasn't an outrageous idea at that time when he was theorizing. This was prior to World War II and prior to the Holocaust. You know, this, the Holocaust was where the theory of eugenics was put into its ultimate practice. Jewish people, disabled people, gay people, and so on, were all killed en masse because they were believed to be bad for the gene pool. Now, apart from Darwin, where did Galton's theory come from? Well, basically what he did uh, was to look at biographical dictionaries, which listed people who were rich and famous and successful, and he looked at those biographies, and what he found is that it was a family link between successful people. Successful people tended to come from the same families. So he hypothesized that this was genetics. Um, any idea what else it could have been? Maybe this is a question for our discussion class. Well, I'll give you a little hint, really, in terms of what Galton overlooked. He rejected the idea that intelligence can be affected by environment. Now, Galton wasn't a wicked man. Yeah, a bit racist, but he was a product of his time. Um, I say a bit racist because eugenics basically was used to show that white people are genetically more superior than black people. And Galton's work basically did that. You know, it was saying that white people are genetically more intelligent than black people. Anyway, yeah, a bit of a racist. Um, but he was a product of his time just as we're a product of our time. And at, those t at that time, these arguments were popular and they were accepted. It was a bit of a racist time back then. Now, Galton believed intelligence could be measured through its association with neural efficiency and sensory ability, or sensory keenness. Having fast reaction times was a signal that we have, you were very intelligent. And he said women were genetically predisposed to be less intelligent than men as they were not employed in jobs uh, that required sensory keen keenness. So, you know, he, went, he decided to go for the full gamut, yeah. <laughs> you know, Colton, not content with just being racist, he thought, oh, I'll be sexist as well. But again, you know, those ideas were dominant at the time. People for females, women were inferior. They weren't allowed to vote, for example. Now, Colton's theory has largely been abandoned you know, particularly the stuff around reaction times. You know, if you've got fast reaction times, as a sign that you're intelligent. But some of Galton's theory still lingers. You know, there are still people who believe that reaction times um, correlate, and they will show this, correlate with psychometric intelligence tests. You know, you can show anything really, but uh, there are people coming up with the evidence to make this link, showing the correlation. Um, we talked about correlations, didn't we, in our class? So, yeah, don't believe all correlations. Um, but basically, Galton's theory is not commonly used, and there remains no standardized measures for Galton's theory. Um, the eugenics project, however, was kept alive and well through the next theory, and this was Spearman's G Factor. Spearman was a British psychologist. He was influenced by Galton's work, but he wanted to make investigations into intelligence more scientific. He thought Galton's not scientific enough. Galton basically found anything. He found evidence to support his ideas. But people kind of questioned, yeah, yeah, you're just pulling in any old thing that will support what you believe. Like the, the, the dictionary, you know, the, the dictionary is full of famous people. You know, that just tended to support what he believed. He, Galton also did twin studies. But it was a bit opportunistic. He just managed to <laughs> just as use twin studies to support his notion of heritability. He ignored the fact that twins that were in his study were actually brought up in the same environment. Twin studies later uh, looked at twins who had been separated at birth, but Golden didn't. Anyway, <laughs> so, so Spearman wanted to make it all more scientific, and he pioneered the statistical procedure of factor analysis in psychology. So if you don't like statistics and psychology, and if you only just survived those 
that teaching week two and teaching week three where we went through statistics. Spearman is the man to blame. Spearman is the person who caused the agony for you. <laughs> He's one of the guys where it all came from. And he was one of the pioneers of factor analysis in psychology. I'm not going to describe factor analysis, but um, hopefully you understand what it is. If you do, let us know. Now, in his research on intelligence, he found a positive, uh, positive correlations between people's performance on different cognitive tasks. And he found that individuals' performance on one type of cognitive task tended to be comparable, comparable, comparable to that of a person's performance on another kind of cognitive task. And he identified those cognitive abilities as specific factors of intelligence. And the correlation between them he called the G factor. And the G factor was the single measure of intelligence. He believed that people differed in the amount of G factor they had. And this G factor could be objectively measured through IQ testing. Uh, testing the people's performance on various cognitive tasks and then deriving the overall G factor score from those tasks results. Now the G factor, also known as general intelligence uh, or general mental ability or even it's known as um, general intelligence factor, this is a concept that's been very influential in um, educational settings, in school testing, but also in the business community. Um, it's been uh, a very influential concept where in employee selection and studies have correlated G-scores with school performance and work performance. The theory was initially very well received as it suggested intelligence could be objectively measured and defined by an IQ test. You can test someone on various cognitive tasks and then derive from those performances an overall G-factor, an overall measure of intelligence. Now, do you have a G-factor? Not to be confused with, with either the X-factor or the G-spot. But do you have a G-factor? I want you to ask yourself how much of this theory makes sense to you. Do you have one type of intelligence? Think about the things you're good at and not good at. Do you think there's one thing that sits behind it all? Well, maybe we could discuss that in class as well. If you want to discuss that, um, again, put it on our agenda. Now, the G-factor theory, Spearman's theory, has been criticised, though. First, it focuses on cognitive ability and doesn't look at things like motor skills or perception skills or musical ability, for example. And perhaps the most famous critique of the construct of G-factor is that it came from a paleontologist and biologist, Stephen J. Gould, in his 1981 book, the Mismeasure of Man. Great book. Um, so it's gold. G-O-U-L-D. Mismeasure of Man. Have a read of that if you get time. What he argued was that psychometricians have wrongly rarefied the G-factor as a physical thing in the brain. And because they did this, they sort of thought the G-factor was a real thing and they actually it was a real thing that existed in the brain, it kept the eugenic project alive and well because it became to be seen as a biological physical entity. G factor became a biological physical thing in many people's minds rather than what it actually was and is, which is just a concept. It's an inference made about a person. So the G factor actually became an area of fascination for people in the field of behavioral genetics. And it established the G uh, factor as something that was heritable, as having a number of biological correlates, which, including brain size. People link G factor with brain size. This research goes on today, but it's, conscious, but, but, it's be, be, but it's contentious because of the fear that this is leading us back down that road of eugenics. The criticism is that the G-factor is actually nothing more than a statistical calculation. It's the outcome of a statistical factor analysis. Indeed, Gold criticised the G-factor for abstracting intelligence as a single entity and for ranking people in a single series of worthiness, arguing that such rankings <coughs> are used to justify the oppression of disadvantaged groups. You know, having a single entity and then saying some people have got more of this thing than other people, and that's what leads to people 
getting treated badly. So as with Galton's intelligence, <coughs> it <coughs> um, theory of intelligence, sorry, um, intelligence came rendered into a simple entity. It became stripped of environmental concerns such as political and cultural factors. Now, we're going to go on to theme three, uh, part two. What am I calling these things? Theme three. Um, I think it's, we're calling it episode B. Let's call it episode. And in upcoming, coming up, <laughs> upcoming, coming up in the next episode, should you choose to tune in, please do. Um, hey, you'd be stupid not to. Coming up in episode 3B. I'm building this up. Do you like it? Coming up in episode 3B. Let's call it 3B. Is Festone's theory, it ain't all about the G factor. And Cattell, Horn and Carroll's theory, the best things come in threes. And Guilford's theory, Rubik's Cube makes a comeback. So I hope to see you in our next episode. Thanks for sticking with this one. See you soon. Bye bye.